speaker is the Dr. Omni Zain. Uh, she's a specialist audiologist at Mediclinic Al Jawhara Hospital in Abu Dhabi. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank uh, Kids Heart, Kids Heart, that they are um, allow me this opportunity to come here and to talk about uh, hearing and children, which is a very uh, rare subject, and uh, not uh, too much people are exposed to this uh, subject. Uh, <clears throat> Before I'm talking about uh, hearing and children, I would like to uh, remind everyone about the uh, anatomy of the hearing in a very brief and then very. <clears throat> in a very brief and in a very simplified way. Uh, the ear, our hearing system, it is consists of uh, three anatomical parts, the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. Uh, the external ear it consists of an auricle and an external auditory canal. The function of the external ear is to uh, resonate and amplify sound, directing it towards the tympanic membrane. The middle ear consists of a tympanic membrane and the ossicles. We have three ossicles, the medius, which is the first one after a tympanic membrane, and the incus and the stapes. The function, uh, number one, tympanic membrane um, converts sound, uh, sound waves into mechanical waves, and then uh, it goes to the ossicles. Uh, the ossicles transmits these mechanical waves to the, tympa uh, <coughs> to the tympanic membrane, uh, which is the second tympanic membrane, which is the oval window, to the inner ear. The inner ear consists of a vestibule uh, and a semicircular canal and a cochlea. The vestibule and the semicircular canal, it is responsible about uh, keep the balance, and if there is any defect in this one, the patient he has a dizziness and balance problem. The cochlea, which is concerning with the hearing. Uh, the vestibule sense of linear acceleration or linear movement, like up and down. Uh, a semicircular canal detect a rotational movement in, in all the angles we can move the head and the body. The cochlea uh, transduces the auditory signals, which is received from the ossicles through the oval window. This uh, auditory signals uh, through the cochlea can be transmitted to el, by the auditory nerve to the brain, to, uh, and the brain can trans, uh, transfer this one and convert this one to speech and language. Uh, before I'm talking about el hearing, and so I would uh, like to remind you about the embryology of el hearing. Why I'm telling that? Because the origin of each part of the three parts of the ear, the external ear, the origin of the external ear, it is different than the middle ear and different than the inner ear. So if the patient he has a congenital problem in the external ear, it doesn't mean that he has a congenital problem in the inner ear or in the middle ear. And the same. Um, in embryology, our origin for, for the external ear, the binna, it is from a fusion of a six auricular uh, hilux, and the external ear, the auditory canal, it is from a the ectoderm of the first pharyngeal cleft. The middle ear and the ear cavity and the eustachian tube, it is from a pharyngeal pouch. The ossicles from the mesoderm of the first and the second pharyngeal arches. The inner ear, the uh, membranous labyrinth from the ectodermal invagination, from the otic bl uh, blasidum, and the pony labyrinth from the mesoderm. Uh, now I would remind also about el, uh, when the baby or uh, when the embryo can hear. And each part of the uh, ear system, our hearing system, when it is uh, start to develop. At the sixth week of pregnancy, the inner ear start to develop. The first organ in the hearing system developed is the inner ear. On the 12th week, the cochlea and the middle ear are forming and the hair cells inside the cochlea start to be developed. At 16 weeks, the baby may hear sound inside uh, a uterus, like a heartbeat of his mother. 
Why you, I'm telling this? Because if the mother, she is exposed during the first trimester of pregnancy to any infection, measles, rubella, or any antibiotics, it might affect the development of the inner ear. At uh, 23 weeks, the baby may hear low pitches. Low pitches means what? It does not, uh, low pitches, it does not mean low sounds. No, low pitches like a doorbell, like uh, something like that. This is a, a low pitches. Uh, which is not sharing in the speech frequencies. It is not the speech frequencies. Because this one, it can be, uh, this is a vibration sound, our vibration, uh, which is the vibration sound. So it can be felt, not be heard. Uh, so he can um, hear this uh, sound, okay? Uh, and it will be very clear to him. At 35 weeks, all parts of the baby ear can, are completely formed, and his hearing become more sensitive to all range of sound, even for the speech. He can hear the speech, but he couldn't understand what is said for him. So um, in many cases, or in all, all, all the cases, usually we advise the mother to um, talk to his baby, even when he is in, in a train. Uh, now, also, I would like to tell about the pediatric milestones in the speech and language development. At the age of three months, the baby can say three letter word. Uh, in the six months, he can say six letter word, which is, which is called the bubbles of the baby. At night, and I want to tell something. Some uh, families, they came for us and said, the baby, he can speak, he can tell, bub, 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 mom, mom, mom. No, it is not uh, speech. It is a vocal cord play, because uh, babies usually, they are trying to uh, move a vocal cord. It is not a, a speech. It is only a, vo a vocal cord play. At nine months uh, from milestones, he can emit, uh, emit some words, and in 12 months, he can say one or two words like Papa, like Mama, and he can understand simple phrases and recognize words for common items. In, 12, in 18 months, he can say uh, about 18 words, and the vocabulary of 18 words um, from 10 to 20 words repeats word overhead, um, and also he can uh, respond to the orders given to him. In, Two years, he can set a sentence of two words or two phrases. And in three years, he can set a, se a sentence of three words. And in four years, he can speak very well like uh, an adult. Now I'm talking about a genetic syndrome associated with hearing loss. It is uh, inherited disease, uh, problems. Uh, just only I put two uh, pictures uh, for the um, Vernonberg syndrome and the Tritron calling uh, syndrome. The first one is the Vernonberg syndrome. Uh, it is a white for uh, lock and uh, heritochromic iridis and the broad mandible and deafness. Usher syndrome, uh, which is very common, rhinitis pigmentosa, ataxia, but most of the cases is retinitis pigmentosa and deafness. We, um, we never saw ataxia too much for this Usher syndrome patient. Bendred syndrome, it is a familial goiter, dysfunctional uh, iodide organization, and deafness. Uh, Albert syndrome, nephritis, deafness, uh, lens, interocular lens defect, and retinitis. Char syndrome, uh, it is uh, quinal atresia, uh, uh, heart defect, intraactual uh, disabilities, and genital hypoplasia, ear anomalies, and deafness. Trichon calling syndrome, usually facial malformation and the cleft palate with deafness. In the Trichon calling syndrome, usually the problem it is a conductive hearing loss. It is a, it's a problem in the middle ear. Our congenital anomalies, it is in the middle ear, not in the inner ear. But all the others, the problem in the inner ear. Other causes of congenital anomalies of the ear, uh, intrauterine infection, including rubella, uh, cytomegalovirus, and the HSV, complica uh, complication associated with the RH factor incompatibility, uh, prematurity, maternal diabetes, toxemia uh, during pregnancy, high, high hypertension, preeclampsia, and lack of oxygen. 
This condition typically causes sensor neural hearing loss. Yani it means that the problem in the inner ear um, and it causes a hearing loss here ranging from mild until severe or to profound hearing loss. Causes of acquired hearing loss. Ear infection, otitis media, and uh, it usually makes a problem in the hearing in the middle ear and it is conductive hearing loss. Autotoxic drugs, uh, especially we saw this uh, case in babies who has a pulmonary infection at birth and they are um, taking a lot of gentamicin or uh, uh, streptomycin. And meningitis and encephalitis, measles and mums, chicken pox, influenza, head injury, and noise exposure. Um, it defects due to a congenital or hereditary problem. Defect in the external ear, microtia, it means a small ear, it's a small oracle, or there is no penna, sometimes it is small or sometimes it disappeared completely or fused completely. Uh, number two, an external acoustic uh, canal atresia, and it is also sometimes it is complete or incomplete. Like this x-ray, this uh, right ear, it is a normal, but this left ear, there is no uh, oracle and there is no external canal at all. It is completely uh, blocked. A middle ear defect, absent or defect of one of the ossicles, and it causes conductive hearing loss. Congenital cholesteatoma, congenital cholesteatoma, it is a very dangerous uh, congenital anomaly because it, it eats or it destroys all the mastoid and it, all the bone and the temporal bone, and nobody can notice until the tympanic membrane becomes perforated and a severe discharge coming from the ear. Um, tympanic membrane is intact and overlies a white mass which can act as a source of infection. Congenital perilymphistula, uh, it is a link between the perilymphatic space. The perilymphatic space, it is the space behind the oval window and behind the stables. A space of the inner ear to the middle ear cavity. Children present with fluctuating and progressive sensor neural hearing loss, uh, plus or minus tinnitus and vertigo. We saw many cases in the clinic like that. The parent come and complaining that the child sometimes he can hear and sometimes he couldn't hear, and especially in the school. So, uh, and sometimes the baby he is uh, very intelligent, or oh, not baby but child, he is very intelligent to tell the parents that I feel dizzy, or they can uh, notice nystagmus in the eye. Uh, and we found this problem in the whole perilymph, it is a com connection between the middle ear and the inner ear. The defect or congenital anomalies in the inner ear. Number one, uh, the cochlear sacular dysplasia. It means collapse of the cochlear duct and saccule. Complete laparincine aplasia, the Michael deformity, complete absence of the inner ear structure. Cochlear aplasia, complete absence of the cochlea, or the cochlear nerve with uh, vestibule and semicircular canal malformation. Common cavity, absence of the normal differentiation between the cochlea and the vestibule, replaced instead by a cystic structure. Cochlear hypoplasia, smaller than a normal cochlea with various <coughs> internal architecture abnormalities. Cochlear incomplete partition, cochlea is clearly separated from the vestibule and the external contour of the cochlea is nearly normal in size, but there are defects in involving the modulus and the intracellular septa. Enlarged vestibular aqueduct, most common inner ear malformation associated with sensorineural hearing loss. Uh, vestibular dilatation, semicircular canal dysplasia, internal auditory canal abnormalities, hypoplastic or absent cochlear nerve hypoplastic or absent common cochlear vestibular nerve. Why I am mentioning all of these inner ear problems? Because if the patient, he has some of these inner ear problems, we couldn't do for him cochlear implantation surgery. Or according to the defect, we can 
custom the electrode of the cochlear implant for this baby. So it is very important to know uh, the congenital anomalies and each one what is what it uh, what it do in the inner ear. And we have to tell the parent about the, our expectation from cochlear implantation. Types of hearing loss. We have three main types of hearing loss. The first one, conductive hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss, it means that the problem in the external canal or the middle ear. And usually, conductive hearing loss, uh, our management, it will be either medical or surgical management. Uh, sensorineural hearing loss. The sensorineural hearing loss, it means it is an inner ear or auditory nerve problem. And a mixed hearing loss, sometimes a problem of the congenital anomalies, it, which is very rare, to be an adult, yes, a mixed hearing loss, it is too much. But in children, uh, it is very rare to find mixed hearing loss. Usually, it is a problem in the middle ear or congenital anomalies in the middle ear plus uh, anomalies in the inner ear, and most probably dysfunction of the hair cells in the cochlea. How we can assess child with hearing loss? Uh, usually the parent coming for us to complain that the child he is not responding even to loud sound, he is not responding like his uh, siblings. Or later on life they are complaining that he has uh, speech and language delayed. The first thing in assessment is the universal hearing screening for a newborn. It is the most essential to discover the baby since day one. Uh, we have two methods to do a uh, hearing screening, a universal hearing screening. The first one, it is an autoacoustic emission. A screening autoacoustic emission, it is, I will, um, say, I will say, uh, um, what is the advantage and disadvantage of these two methods? The advantage of a uh, screening autoacoustic emission, it is very fast. It can be done in two or three minutes maximum. Uh, the stimulus you are using here, it is called um, transient autoacoustic emission. A transient autoacoustic emission, um, it can be very sensitive to a wide range of frequencies from one kilohertz till four kilohertz. But the problem is the baby he has hearing loss more than 35 decibel, it will give us failed screening. Uh, and 35 uh, decibel, it can be from some amniotic fluid in the uh, external canal, or there's noise around a baby in the incubator or in the uh, delivery room. The second uh, one, it is an automated auditory brain stem response. An automated br auditory brain stem response, this is automated auditory brain stem response, and this is the um, autoacoustic image. Autoacoustic image, it is only Five one. Minutes, please. Sorry? Five minutes. Uh, this one, it is only prop, can be in the ear, but this one, we put three electrodes, okay, and we give the baby the stimulus here, it is called click stimulus, and it is more sensitive in a more wide frequency range, and, but also if the baby, he has hearing loss more than uh, 50 decibel, it will give us field uh, results. Um, if the baby he has field results, we have to uh, refer him for more diagnostic uh, investigation. The first thing, we have to uh, make otoscopic examination for the baby. Why we have to do otoscopic examination? Number one, maybe he has atresia, okay, and the uh, external canal, it is very narrow, so you have to diagnose this one. Or maybe he have some, still he has some fluid from an amniotic A fluid. Number two, a tympanogram. A tympanogram, it measures a function of the middle ear and a movement of the tympanic membrane. And if there's any ossicular chain disruption, it can be diagnosed from a tympanometry. But we have a problem in tympanometry. Tympanometry, we have two props. One of them, it is 225 hertz, which is not suitable for uh, babies. And the other one is, is a special uh, prop for the kids. It is uh, six, uh, 600 uh, hertz or 1,000 hertz. It is the one suitable to diagnose a middle ear problem in uh, babies and in kids. Here, this is the various variation of a tympano, tympanometry result. 
Type A, it is a normal. It means that a middle ear normal, normal ventilation of the middle ear, and normal ocular chain. Type uh, C, it means there is a negative pressure in the uh, middle ear, okay? This is the one type C. It means that there is a uh, negative pressure in the middle ear, and this baby, he has a problem in the nose, or he has a cleft palate, or cleft lip, or something like that. Type B, it means that the middle ear full of um, fluid, and there is no aeration at all in the uh, middle ear. All of this, it can affect the uh, screening. Now, the most common and the most important diagnostic test for a hearing uh, field a child is auditory brain stem response. Auditory brain stem response, uh, we, <clears throat> this is the wave of auditory brain stem response, and this is the way we can do for auditory brain stem response. We put four electrodes, one in the vertex, one in the forehead, and one uh, behind on the mastoid of the left ear and one in the mastoid of the right ear. Okay, and we put a small prop in the ear of the child and this small prop or headphones uh, generates a special modulated stimulus which is called either click stimulus or uh, tone burst stimulus or shrimp stimulus, okay? And this stimulus has the ability to stimulate from the cochlea passing the auditory nerve until we reach the brain stem. Here, uh, wave one, we have this five waves. This is the important waves for auditory pain stem response. Uh, wave one, it is usually generated from a distal part of an auditory nerve, which is the cochlea. Wave two, uh, it is uh, generated from a geniculate uh, body, which is a connection between a cochlea and an auditory nerve. Wave three, it is from the cochlear nucleus. Wave five, from a superior olivary complex. Uh, wave four, sorry, and wave five, it is from the lateral, lateral meniscus. And wave uh, six and seven, it is from the inferior colliculus. Uh, here, the auditory brain stem response, I want to go back to the auditory brain stem response because uh, there is one question. Shall I do auditory brain stem response while the child sleep? or awake, while the, the child sedated or under general anesthesia. No, a dental brain stem response should be done while the child or the baby sedated or sometimes under GA, light GA, because it is a very sensitive test. And from this test, we want to diagnose the child if he has a hearing problem and what will be the level of his hearing loss and how we can manage. This is number one. Number two, an autistic child, from the amplitude of these waves, we can diagnose or can give us idea about that this, this child, he has an autistic problem. A patient, our child with delayed language and normal peripheral hearing, and he has a central hearing. So from the latencies of these uh, waves, we can diagnose that he has a central auditory problem. And if he, this child, he has a central auditory problem, we have to open a window of the auditory brain stem response to be a middle latency response, okay? And if still we find something normal, because as you know, an auditory pathway until the cortex, until the higher cortex, we can open again a window to a higher cortex, our late auditory response, and even for the cognitive function for a P400, okay? So I don't uh, advise anyone to do uh, auditory brain stem response as a commercial uh, thing or number two, there is uh, too much equipment now that they said that we can do auditory brain stem response without uh, sleeping of the child. Doctor, and sorry to interrupt. We have to wrap up. <laughs> still there is, uh, I don't know, but um, still we have a behavioral geometry and this one, it depends on a uh, patient's response. And uh, grade of hearing loss, the mild hearing loss, it is from 20 decibel to 35 decibel. A moderate hearing loss from 35 to 55. Severe hearing loss from 55 to 75. Severe to profound uh, from 50, uh, 75 to 90 decibel. And then a profound hearing loss. Management of hearing loss. As I told, conductive hearing loss, 
medical or surgical treatment. This child, he has uh, this one, it is a hearing aid, it is a bone conduction hearing aid, and this is due to problem in the middle ear, so we cannot put for him a conventional hearing aid, we put for him a bone conduction hearing aid. If the child has sensory neural hearing loss, the management, it depends on the grade of a hearing loss. If it is mild or moderate, we have to put for him a hearing aids. If he is severe to profound, we will uh, go to a cochlear implantation surgery. This is the hearing aid, the normal hearing aid, and this is a cochlear implantation surgery. Uh, when we have to interfere, this is the last thing, we have to interfere as early as possible we diagnose the child, even if he has one month old, we have to put for him hearing aids until he uh, complete one year, you can do for him cochlear implantation. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for Thank you, Dr. Omnia.